Hi everyone, just a note if you're if you're here already, you're on time, which is great. We are gonna wait just a couple minutes um, to give everyone a little time to join us before we start. So just a note that um, we'll be waiting just a couple minutes, not too many. Hi everyone, if you're joining us just now, just know that um, we're gonna be waiting just a few more minutes um, to make sure that everyone can join us. Thanks so much for joining us here and we'll be going um, shortly. Thanks again. you're just joining us, we'll be waiting just another minute or so um, for uh, everyone to be able to enter the webinar, make sure that they have the link correct. So um, just, a, just another minute, thanks so much for joining us and we'll be starting very soon. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us here today um, in celebration of um, a book we are all so excited and grateful for, Carolyn Holbrook's um, book, um, Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify. It's our absolute pleasure at the University of Minnesota Press to um, be partnering with Carolyn um, on this book. Um, a few just notes of housekeeping before we start. Um, first, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm an editor at the um, University of Minnesota Press. More importantly, I've gotten to become Carolyn's friend working on this, so that's even more important. Um, but um, just a few bits of housekeeping, and then my job is to get out of the way um, so that we can listen to everyone today. Um, just so you know, this, this event is being recorded. Um, and so it'll be available after this through the University of Minnesota Press's YouTube channel. So you can feel free to um, look at it, listen to it, share it um, in the spirit of sharing stories and having this event kind of reach out to those who maybe weren't able even to join us today. Um, know that, that this will be recorded and feel free to um, subscribe to the University of Minnesota Press YouTube channel for this and, and other great events as well. We do have closed captioning for this event as well. If it's not on automatically, you should see a function at the bottom of your screen. Um, it may say CC live transcript um, at the bottom or top. Uh, you can click on that and click on enable auto transcription. 
so that you can have closed captioning today. Um, we will have time at the end of this event for some viewer questions. So you can please post comments in the Q&A feature um, at the top of the window probably for your Zoom. Um, and we'll do our best to get as many to as many of the questions as possible. We often get so many we may not have all the time, but uh, we thank you in advance for, for your questions. Um, lastly, before, before I introduce Carolyn, um, it's of course incredibly important um, for all of us, certainly from us at the press, uh, to support independent bookstores in this time. We're very, very grateful to have Moon Palace uh, as our partner bookstore for this event. And we'd um, love to encourage you to purchase Carolyn's book from Moon Palace. Um, and they will be signed copies, thanks to the bookstore and to Carolyn. Um, you can either call the bookstore or um, order through their website. And we will be posting a direct link um, to Carolyn's book at the um, bookstore um, in the chat today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so with that, I think I have most of the, the housekeeping in place. Um, again, it is my absolute uh, joy to get to present um, my friend Carolyn. Um, I will say right up front that we are joined by an incredible group of people today. Um, um, Carolyn will be surrounded um, by some incredible voices as well. Carolyn's going to be introducing everyone else. It's my gift to get to introduce Carolyn. Um, Carolyn, congratulations. Um, I can't tell you, you know, that I'm very grateful um, for my job, but one of the main reasons is um, for the people that I that I get to work with. Um, it's an absolute gift and a pleasure. And um, over these years of working with Carolyn, not just on this book, um, but on many projects, I have uh, had the gift of seeing firsthand um, not only her tremendous ability and skill and effect as a writer, but with people. Um, I've sat at many different tables with her, um, whether it was at Dr. Josie Johnson's kitchen table working on her memoir with uh, Josie and Arlita Little, um, whether it was sitting uh, with communities of women whose lives were impacted by violence um, and can seeing Carolyn's work in helping um, them find a space to write um, in working with Carolyn now on some very exciting future projects around um, her amazing um, program, More Than a Single Story. Um, she's also meant so much to me, probably more than she knows. Um, I've, I've had the joy of, of being on phone calls with her that were just the call that I needed um, in terms of clarity and her gift of insight and support um, and love has, has meant a lot to me. And, and really, I only say that not because of me, but because I know that if I felt it, I can just imagine for me, who's only worked with Carolyn for a few years, how many um, lives Carolyn has, um, has had such an incredible impact on over the many years of her work. Um, she, of course, is a writer, an educator, and longtime advocate for the healing power of the arts. Um, she has been the founder and executive artistic director and a program director at very um, incredible literary organizations around our community. And right now, she leads more than a single story, a series of panel discussions and community conversations for people of color and indigenous writers and arts activists. Her personal essays have appeared widely, including in collections such as A Good Time for the Truth and Blues Vision. She, of course, has received the Kay Sexton Award from the Minnesota Book Awards and two Minnesota State Arts Board Initiative grants. Um, she teaches creative writing at Hamlin University, and I've had the gift as well of sitting in those classrooms and seeing the effect that her teaching has directly to students. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to, and, and, and with a lot of love, I present Carolyn Holbrook to you today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eric for that beautiful introduction. And thanks also for shepherding me through the process of publishing my book. Especially, I wanna thank you for putting up with my whining throughout this process. And Heather Skinner, oh my goodness, you are such an amazing publicist. I am so grateful to you, to Eric, and to everyone at the University of Minnesota Press for championing my work, and also for all the time and attention that you give your authors. Thank you so much. And thanks to my granddaughters, Nia, Naja, and Tess, who are with me today, and also my friends Artika Tyner and Pamela Fletcher, 
for sharing this moment for with, with me. And also great big thanks to all of you who are in the audience today behind that Zoom screen. It's amazing that friends and family and interested readers can join any events from anywhere now um, while we're being stuck at home. I must tell you, I have a frog in my throat. and I'm trying to you know, speak over the frog in my throat. I apologize. <laughs> so now many people have asked about the title of my book and about the structure. So let's begin with the title. I begin my book with a section of a poem by the great Lucille Clifton, in which she is visiting a cemetery on a plantation in South Carolina. So I'm gonna read the section that I quote in my book. At the cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989, by Lu Lucille Clifton. Nobody mentions slaves, and yet the curious tools shine with your fingerprints. Nobody mentioned slaves, but somebody did this work who had no guide, no stone, who molders under rock. Tell me your names, tell me your bashful names, and I will testify. From there, I moved to the prologue where, where I tell the story of a visit from an ancestor who commands me to tell our story. I took it to mean my family's story, but it could also mean to testify on behalf of myself my ancestors, my children, and on certain aspects of the story of my people. And the book is definitely a memoir, but it is structured as a series of standalone essays. And this is largely because the essays were written over a lengthy period of time, beginning in the 1980s when my, when my five children were in their teens. And the book discusses a variety of themes, such as my career as a literary arts administrator. I talk about building my career while raising five children as a divorced single mother. I talk about my struggles with depression and with the racism that is hidden under Minnesota nice and more. So with the essay structure though, you don't have to read the book from cover to cover. You can pick it up, read an essay or two, you can put it down and pick it up another day and read a different essay. And you still you know, stay with the flavor of the book. So in one of the essays, I talk about a time when I was asked to erase my identity. I was asked to take the black out of my voice while I was auditioning for a voice acting job. I discussed how that incident reminded me of when Kunta Kinte, the protagonist in Alex Haley's epic Roots, was commanded to use a name that would be acceptable to those who enslaved my people. He was beaten until there was hardly anything left of him, until he was forced to give in. We were enslaved some 401 years ago, but we're still being asked to erase ourselves in myriad ways to lighten our skin, straighten our hair, to be ashamed of our heritage, to accept being beaten and murdered by those whose jobs are supposed to be to protect us, to compartmentalize in many awful ways in the workplace and in school. As Dr. Artika Tyner, who is with me today, pointed out in a recent conversation, there are so many situations where we find ourselves having to stop, take a deep breath, and decide who we're gonna show up as before we go into a situation. And even then, we're too often not seen or heard as the beautiful, powerful people that we are. Through telling parts of my own story in this book, I'm attempting to perhaps join others who are in conversation about the deep and lasting humanity of our people. I had my daughters and granddaughters in mind throughout my writing. In several of the essays, I speak about attempts throughout our history and today to negate and essentially erase black women and girls. And I'm excited that three of my five granddaughters are joining me today. So let's get started. First, I'm going to introduce my granddaughters. And then Naja, who is the youngest granddaughter, is going to read a poem that she wrote. And following that, then the three of them are going to read chapter one of my book titled My Roots. So let me introduce my girls and you guys can turn on your, your faces, if you will. First, there's Naja <laughs> David. Oh, hi, Tess. Hi, Naja and Nia. Okay, first there's Naja Davis. She is a senior at De La Salle High School. She enjoys making fun memories with her friends and her loving family. She also finds time to discuss social issues that affect certain groups in America. She believes that any change begins with conversation. Next is her older sister, Nia Davis. She's a junior at Norfolk State University in HBCU, which is a historically black college and university. Um, this is located in Norfolk, Virginia, where she is pursuing a Bachelor of Science degree in business management. 
She loves hanging out with friends and watching movies with her family. And there's my firstborn granddaughter, Tess Montgomery, up there in the corner. Tess is a young communicator and visionary. She's a digital marketing specialist at TPT, Twin Cities PBS, and she's marketing and communications manager for my organization, More Than a Single Story, which she essentially helped me start. She's a 2018 fellow with the Josie R. Johnson Leadership Academy, a 2017 fellow with New Sector Academy, and she serves as programming chair of the Young, Pro no, excuse me, Young Nonprofit Professionals Network of the Twin Cities. Tess is passionate about the power of grassroots community-led organizing. She holds a degree in journalism and mass communications from Drake University, and she re was recently named one of 15 up-and-coming PR and social media marketers to watch by ACH Communications. So welcome my daughters, my, my three of my five granddaughters. And we'll start with Naja, who's going to read a poem that she wrote. Hi. Um, so this poem I wrote last year in my creative writings class. Um, it's strongly inspired by Sandra Cisneros poem called Abuelito Who. It's kind of in the same format, but it's about my grandma, Carolyn Hoover. Grandma Who. Grandma who shows love like no one else and asks who remembers her, who is warmth and comfort, who is memory and frame, whose locks are made from long lines of wisdom and struggle, is too exhausted to get out of bed, who tells me you come from strong woman, who tells her family I am proud of who you've become, whose brown skin is coffee in the afternoon, who wishes she'll have visitors soon, corrects papers with her morning oatmeal, who used to watch cartoons with me and Nia, is unique, is a mother elephant that spreads through generations, is worrisome, doesn't live a life of her own, is sharing more than a single story, who laughs a contagious laugh, is soul in words and pen, is a rainbow that shines after the rain, asking who remembers her, who remembers her, who. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Naja. I'm so glad I got to hear that poem a few weeks ago because, you know, if I was hearing it for the first time, I would just be sobbing right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then Naja now is going to be joined by Nia and Tess. And they're going to read the first chapter of my book called My Roots. Now, I begin each chapter with a quote from some, either from someone that I care deeply about or a quote that just really struck me as something that fits the chapter. So the quote that I use from My Roots is from the great Dr. Josie Johnson, whose memoir I had the privilege of helping her to write along with Arlita Little. And here's what she said on the night that we launched her book last year. Let's leave tonight promising to tell our stories because we weren't intended to survive. Take that in, y'all. We're still here. <laughs> All right. I was a small child when my parents divorced. My mother moved my three siblings and me from our home in Ann Arbor, Michigan to make a new life in Minneapolis, and dad moved his new family to Springfield, Massachusetts. Life is never easy for a single parent, and mama was no exception. I always bristle when I hear white feminists talk about work as a privilege. Black women have always had to work, often cleaning the houses of wealthy white women who were privileged to work outside their homes. In addition to cleaning houses, mama also did piecework in a factory where she was paid according to the amount of work she produced. But even with two jobs, she had to resort to commodities such as government cheese and a spam-like meat substance in order to keep food on the table. Even so, she kept our home spotless, made our clothes, kept us clean, and nursed us through our childhood illnesses. She found creative ways to stretch that tasteless government food, often inventing dishes she hoped we would enjoy, being sure to include servings of fruit and the fresh vegetables she grew in the garden she kept on the side of our house. And she spent a lot of time in the hot summers canning, so the produce from her garden would last through the cold Minnesota winter months. Like her mother before her, my mother wanted to be a hairstylist. Over time, she accomplished her dream in a much larger way than she had envisioned when she was a young mother struggling to keep food on the table. She worked her way through beauty school and then went to work at B's Beauty Shop in South Minneapolis. Her struggle continued for a while, but things got easier after she met Barney. I was about 12 years old when Mama and Barney met married and he brought his young son to live with us. A gentle and loving man, Barney was a terrific father and stepfather. He adored my mother and us children. Mama treated his son as though he were her own child 
and we all accepted him as our brother. To this day, my children's face is brightening during frequent mentions of Grandpa Barney. In, this in his professional life, Welton Barney Barnett was the first black auditor for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, but his real passion was music. He picked his left-handed Fender Telecaster guitar in small combos and also with a big band that played in a ritzy suburban supper club with the what called the White House. We kids loved watching him when he sat on the couch quietly practicing, his amplifier turned off so as to not disturb the family, and we enjoyed dancing around in time to the music when his friends came over and to practice in our basement. It was unfortunate that in keeping with the times, Barney was forced to enter the supper club through the back door while his white bandmates went through the front door. While I was preparing for an estate sale after Mama and Barney passed away, I came across an obituary about Barney and an archived 1985 edition of Downbeat Magazine. There, for the first time, we children learned that he had played with jazz legends Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington in his New York City heydays in the 40s. Uh, Mama and Barney both had good heads for business and together they opened Mama's own beauty salon, Joanna Salon of Beauty on 48th Street and 4th Avenue in South Minneapolis at a time when he practiced, when the practice of redlining limited black families to living and doing business in areas that were not as far south as that neighborhood. Later, after her first employer B passed away, they bought the building B had owned and turned it into a beauty school. Career Beauty Academy was the first and only African immune African-American beauty school to ever exist in the state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, they were unable to sustain it. She closed after five short years, but that did not stop my courageous mother. She opened another salon and also accepted an invitation to start a cosmetology program in the Minneapolis Public Schools, a program that still exists at Edison High School. And when she, when she was almost 60 years old, after she had owned and operated two beauty salons and the beauty school, and after she had started the program for the public schools, I proudly witnessed my amazing mother march across the stage of Northrop Auditorium at the University of Minnesota to accept the Bachelor of Science degree in vocational education she had earned. I come from a long line of role models, Black women, entrepreneurs, and educators. My maternal grandmother developed and sold a line of hair products and taught her patrons how to use them. My great-grandmother, together with my great-grandfather, turned their home into a boarding house for African-American railroad porters in Lincoln, Nebraska, where porters were not allowed to stay in hotels. I'm proud to, to be the inheritor of my foremother's remarkable, enterprising spirit. It's because of their legacy that I've been able to achieve as much as I have. Those are my three of my five granddaughters. Jordan lives in Chile, so she couldn't be here, and Zandra is probably at work. But thank you, you guys. So, next, I'm just very excited to introduce Pamela Fletcher Bush and Dr. Artika Tyner, who are going to, jo going to join me in a conversation about the book. Pamela Fletcher is a CEO and publisher of St. Paul Almanac and Professor Emerita of English at St. Catherine University. She's an editor whose projects include the St. Paul Almanac Anthony, excuse me, Anthology, the Rondo Children's Book Series, Blues Vision, African American Writing for Minnesota, The Way We See It, A Fresh Look at Vision Loss, and Transforming a Rape Culture. Fletcher Bush's poetry and prose appear in a range of publications and have earned awards and grants, including the St. Catherine's, St. Catherine University's Denny Prize for Distinction in Creative Writing, the International Pan-African Literary, Literary Forum's W.E.B. Du Bois Scholar and Creative Nonfiction Award, a Minnesota State Arts Board Fellowship, and the Lofts Creative Nonfiction Residency Award. As an educator and a scholar, she has lectured around, abroad, excuse me, she has lectured abroad in Canada, England, Ghana, and Mexico. Welcome, Pamela Fletcher Bush. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Artika Artiner is a passionate educator author, sought after speaker, and advocate for justice. At the University of St. Thomas School of Law, Dr. Tyner serves as the founding director of the Center on Race, Leadership, and Social Justice. She is committed to training students to serve as social engineers who create new inroads to justice and freedom. Dr. Tyner manages planting people, 
Growing Justice Press, which promotes literacy, cultural awareness, and leadership development. She has written and published Justice Makes a Difference, Amazing Africa A to Z with Monica Habia, Joey and Grandpa Johnson's Day in Rondo, and Kofi Loves Music. She has also partnered with the American Bar Association to publish The Lawyer as Leader, How to Plant People and Grow Justice, and The Leader's Journey, A Guide to Discovering the Leader Within. Welcome, Artika. So we have, um, we have a little time to have a discussion. Where, where do you want to start? <laughs> I want to start with the quote that you read from Dr. Josie Johnson. It reminded me a bit of the words of Audre Lorde, and I'll, I'll read them because I thought about this as I was reading chapter one. It says, when we speak, we are afraid. Our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, you're still afraid. So it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Yeah. So I saw that as a common theme throughout the book. Give us a sense of what was your inspiration? What led to survival despite all the trials and tests of life? And what gave you the inspiration to testify in the way that you're doing today? Well, that's such a wonderful question. Um, I think it's primarily my children. Um, you know, because when, when I found myself alone, um, you know, after, after divorce, being divorced and, you know, having to raise five kids, there's a few ways that I could have gone. And, you know, just, the, it was not easy. We had a lot of struggles, as my kids will testify. Um, but it was just important for me that they know from day one that that was not the only uh, option for them. That you know they could grow into, you know, um, into their own beautiful selves that they all are, and you know lead very powerful, positive, and productive lives. And so just keeping that in front of me. Um, all at all times was really important. Um, I said that I started writing the book in the 80s when they were teenagers. I started doing that by um, writing these tiny little essays about some of the funny things that the kids did and said. Um, and I did that as a way to keep myself sane. <laughs> but as it turned out, somebody picked it up and they liked it. And I, um, they became a column. I called it Diary of a Single Mother by Beatrice Mullins. And it was published um, as a, I think a bi-weekly column in our neighborhood newspaper, which at that time was the, the Whittier Globe. And it, it won two neighborhood, two awards in the Neighborhood Press Association over the next few years. So yeah, and that just encouraged me to keep going and keep writing and keep trying to, you know, do things that would encourage my kids to, you know, keep developing their own lives. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask a related question. You you spoke of um, Kante Kente, um, mm -hmm. that piece and and that story that you read from regarding um, say what is it is it is it say what? Yeah, that's the title of the piece. Okay, and and I just wanted to say that in case anybody wants to read along, but the 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 piece about the naming. I think is really profound because you've mentioned how he was beaten to an inch of his life. So he would say that he was not Kuta Kente, but that he was Toby. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about, you know, having to give up your identity and the whole issue of naming, it's, it's so important for black people. And so you um, have the, the chapter about, I want to know my name. And so at the end, you say that you want to know your name. And so do you, have you figured out your name? Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, an, an, that was really quite an interesting time. Um, the short answer is no. I don't believe that my name is the name that my parents gave me but it's the name that I answer to. Um, I don't know uh, of another name for me, but I think there is one. You know, that's probably a weird and convoluted response, but that's all I have <laughs> for that question. Okay. <laughs> you 
you also brought me into a sacred space that I remembered in being at, at Hamlin in Dr. Vina Dale's classroom. We did a study of Black women and women of color in science fiction. So I was introduced to Octavia Butler. I was a little disappointed that it wasn't much sooner in my life. But we have then that idea of Afrofuturism. This mm -hmm. idea that Afrofuturism is that sense of I am, I was, and I will be. So how does that relate to some of the essays that you're talking about? As you go back and look to, to the past, you get a sense of that I am, and then you get a sense of also that I was. But how do we relate to, how do you imagine the I will be? What is the future after we read the book? What's the future, even some of your aspirations as we move forward? Yeah, you know, we're in a constant state of trying to figure out what we want to be when we grow up. And um, yeah, and even at my age, I am figuring, still trying to figure that out. Um, I had a beautiful conversation with my writing buddy, Diane Wilson, uh, a few weeks ago about the healing power of, of of writing and of, of connecting with our ancestors and how healing is, you know, it, it, it includes the past, the present and the future. And, um, you know, I think in order for us to be, to even develop a clear vision of where we're going, uh, we have to tap into those who came before us. And there is so much beauty and power in our people, even along with the, um, struggles that that we continue to have um, that you know I don't know if this is answering your question but I I am trying to figure out you know what is next for me I know that I'm working on an anthology with David Mira um, around more than a single story I'm also thinking of returning to um, uh, a novel that I started 20 some years ago and maybe it's time for me to play around with that. Um, I hope to continue teaching forever because I love working with students and meeting people like the two of you um, and just you know seeing what, what, what you're doing that is so powerful for yourselves and for younger people. I hope to um, you know, continue to try to mentor younger arts administrators and writers um, and young women and work with, continue to work with my daughters and my granddaughters on you know, whatever it is that that they're dealing with in their own lives. Yeah. And my sons too. I don't mean to, you know, ignore Julian and Stevie. They're a big part of my life too. Well, speaking <laughs> of teaching, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that particular aspect of your life. Um, I want to read a quote from Marion Wright Elderman's book, The Me Measure of Our Success, letter oh. to my children and yours that she wrote in 1992. And, um, and so I thought a lot about the quote in this book while I was reading your book. And particularly as you talk about your children and how important your children are and what you have, the lessons you want to impart to your children, not just you know, from the classroom, but from life and from your own life. And so she says in this quote, we must not assume the door is closed, but must push on it. We must not assume if it was closed yesterday that it's closed today. Mm -hmm. And so um, based on reading your book, I see that you use both teaching and writing, but, but, but teaching particularly to push on those closed doors that you've encountered in your life. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about um, two pieces that resonate with me a lot, particularly as an educator myself, uh, Coming Clean, which is mm -hmm. early, very early on in the book, mm -hmm. and Reflection on Teaching. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I see those, even though they, you only have two that are directly, but in and out of your essays, you do refer to your education and how you impart education and the importance of you of your being a mentor and a teacher. And so I just want you to talk a little bit about that particular aspect, an important aspect, the found, which I consider the foundation, you know, to your success in your journey to this point. I had two really marvelous teachers in my own life. Um, one was my eighth grade English teacher, 
um, when I was in, in high school, in junior high school, um, I was one of the bad kids. I was always in the principal's office. I was always getting in fights. I was, you know, just always in trouble. And yet my eighth grade English teacher seemed to notice that there was something else there beyond that little girl that was, you know, just had this surly attitude. And um, she encouraged me, she encouraged me um, to continue writing. I wrote a poem in her class that she really liked. And she somehow made me believe that um, I had something to say that was important. And then later, um, you know, after I came back home after being married and, you know, came home and decided that it was time for me to um, take some writing classes, even though in the, in the midst of all the chaos that I was living in, um, my kids played at, at Whittier Park on 26th and, um, you know, where Whittier School is now. And the guy who ran the park, Lawrence Hutera, um, he was a performing artist and he had a lot of performing things going on at the park. And I asked him if he would consider having a creative writing class at the park. And he told me that if I could find someone to teach it, he would do all he could to make it happen. And you know, because I, as I said earlier, I really wanted my kids to, to know that there's something beyond, you know, being poor and broke. I started a secretarial service in my home and I taught my kids how to type and how to proofread and all that. And we had our little business going, put an ad in the Minnesota Daily. And, uh, you know, I started typing papers and the kids were helping me with that. And then I was also started because one of the people who, um, uh, who came to me for typing was a teacher that my son Julian brought to me um, when he was in fifth grade, who um, was teaching a poetry class in his school. I didn't even know that there was a poetry in the school's program then. Um, but, you know, one day while I was at the park, I saw a group of elderly people sitting in the, in the lounge and I asked Lawrence who they were. And he said that they were a group of, of psychics who had a church there. I said, oh, okay. And about that time, one of the old men said, looked at me and said, you're a teacher. I said, no, I'm not. I just run the, the writing program here. He said, oh, you are a teacher. Someday you'll see. And a couple of days after that, <laughs> um, my friend Julie Landsman invited me to come and visit her class at Perpich Center for the Arts because she liked the way I wrote dialogue. So I went out there and it was my first time in front of a class of students. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And from there, I just over time, just gradually began to, you know, take more classes and began to visit other people's classes and began to realize that students responded somehow to whatever it was that I was, you know, trying to teach. <laughs> and I just realized that, wow, that old man was right. And, um, you know, I feel that, you know, with the, the mistakes that I made as a, as a single mother with, with five children, that, you know, being able to work with other people's children has been sort of a, mm, I don't know, has helped me a lot um, in ways that I don't even know if, if I can, you know, talk about right now because they're not on the top of my mind, but they're, they're in the book. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I think it's just, the, and, and there's so many ways that we teach without even realizing it. You know, I was having coffee one day outside of a coffee shop and a woman came up to me and she said, I just finished my master's degree because of what you said. And I'm saying, I, you know, I congratulated her and told her how wonderful it was, but I have no idea who she was. <laughs> and it's just one of the examples of how we touch people's lives without even realizing we're doing it. You know, they remember us, we don't remember them. But thankfully, you know, whatever we are saying or, or you know, is, is mm -hmm. having an impact that we don't even know we're having. Um, I don't know if that made sense, but. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. The crucial part though is the point about your own story and how when you imparting your own story to them, particularly to the kids that were not really receptive to you at first. Because yeah, very the coming clean chapter. Yeah, yeah. we're being very professorial, and that was not working. <laughs> so, yeah. that, you know, you're not saying anything that we care about or has anything to do with us. So, mm -hmm. I think you're you're being vulnerable. So, talk about about the importance of of one's lived life, the stories that 
that are really important. Mm -hmm. So in that chapter, yes, I do talk about working with a group of teen parents and how, um, yeah, I mean, I went in there with a plan. You know, it was going to be a 10-week class. It was a 10-week class. And I went in there with a plan of how I was going to do it. And, you know, the kids were bored at first. And they told me they were bored. And then one of the little girls said, well, you know, you don't know anything about us. You know, why do you think you can come in here and, you know, teach us something when you don't even know anything about us? So, you know, I just threw my plan away. It just threw it right out the window because it made no sense for me to keep trying to do that. But what they really wanted was authenticity. They wanted to know, you know, they, me and they wanted me to know them. So I told them my story. I told them that I was a teen mother, that I had been incarcerated, uh, that I had spent six months of my teenage pregnancy on the, on the maternity ward of the Minnesota University of Minnesota Hospital. And, you know, I told them how there was so much in this chapter that I, you know, I can share, if I can find it, but is there a specific part that you'd like me to read, Pamela? Uh, I don't know if there's a particular part. Um, well, I think that when you said that they were so surprised that they just looked yeah. at you like, you know, with marvel, right? You yeah. know, could this really have happened to this woman? And she's speaking, she's speaking our lives, you know, mm -hmm. or speaking lives that we really know about and at first she seemed so far away. So yeah. I think that that was really profound, really mm -hmm. profound. And, and as teachers, you really wanna be able to make that kind of impact. Right. Yeah, so for me, it's just about being real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> yeah, that's good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd like for you, if you're willing to read a bit of the passage from page 183, that's in your essay on stones and sticks. And it was one of the things as a civil rights attorney that spoke to me when you talked about the invisible incarceration of women and of black women in particular. And I'd never heard someone talk about it in such a profound and impactful way. So if you'd read a bit of page 183, and tell us about those chains and what we all can do to help break some of them. Mm. Okay. So yeah, let me just set that chapter up a little bit. Um, stones and sticks, which is obviously a play on sticks and stones may break your bones. Uh, and, and let me just interject right here that the wonderful Ben Mackay um, from the African American Registry has created a few scenes from this chapter that you can find on the African American Registry website, which is the largest, most comprehensive website on African American history in the nation. And it's located right here in Minneapolis. But um, in this story, I talk about how um, I was taking a, a class on video poetry back in 1983 when it wasn't all that popular. And it was a class that we offered at Whittier and I got to take all the classes free. So I, you know, I took that one. And um, this little girl, who I call Gretel in the piece, um, wanted to write about roller skating through a graveyard. And so she put on her skates and we went over to Lakewood Cemetery and we're following her around this, the, the cemetery, looking at, you know, all the flowers, all the crypts, all the, you know, plaques on the ground and all that. And, you know, it just felt so wrong to me, but I did it anyway. But um, so finally, you know, she stopped and, she saw this old weather beaten statue and it was tarnished with green and black stains. And she looked at us with this stupid grin on her face and she said, it's a statue of a black woman. If you touch her, you'll die. And I, of course, was the only one in the group who heard her the way that I heard her. It was a small group, but I was the only black person in the group. So I will start reading there. I was paralyzed, unable to respond. I took another look at the woman locked in that dark body made of granite and in my mind's eye, her shoulders began to slump from carrying the weight of all that stone. She seemed to crumble under the burden of overwork and underappreciation from cooking and cleaning for the families of Reddell's ancestors while desperately trying to care for her own family, the families of my ancestors. At that moment, I remembered every negative image I ever heard of black women, oversexed, breeder, wet nurse, mammy, hostile, nappy-headed hoe. Gretel's words named something I had felt vaguely all my life but had not been able to describe with words of my own. 
I have three beautiful, intelligent daughters. I've had to help them maintain their self-images over and over again, even as I've attempted to heal my own. I also fully understand the horror of what is happening to our young men. I have a son who was incarcerated, but there seems to be a conspiracy of silence around our girls and women. Could it be that in large part, our incarceration is invisible, that we're locked up in our bodies? I left the cemetery wondering what it would take to liberate us. Today, I watch my grandchildren move through a world where the current president has given the green light to white supremacy following President Obama's eight years of hope, and where once again, black and brown bodies are under violent attack. And I have to ask, what is it that will set us free? So for me, you know, just trying to, um, you know, continuing to talk with my daughters and my granddaughters, to hear them when they're, when they're, when they're crying, whether it's, um, you know, actual crying or just, you know, talking about, you know, what just happened to them, you know, how they were just followed around a store or saw somebody, you know, uh, negated them for whatever reason. Um, just trying to do all I can to try to nurture them and to, you know, um, include in their lives, you know, books, stories, movies, you know, by people like yourself, Artika and Pamela, um, who are very well versed in our history, um, helping them to you know, just see the beauty and who they are, take them back to through the history of, you know, our own, our own personal roots. My cousin Stephanie has written um, a book about our, our family's roots in Lincoln, Nebraska and Missouri. And, um, you know, there's so much in that book that we just didn't know because she's a wonderful researcher and genealogist. And just making sure that your children know who they are, know who their families are, know where they come from. And as much as we can about um, our history is, is so important for them. And helping them to recognize, as Josie Johnson mentioned during several conversations, that this time that we're living in with, with uh, the person in the White House, we've been through this stuff before. We've been through it before, mm -hmm. and we are still here. People, some people, you know, call COVID-19, COVID-1619 because the first slave ship landed in 1619, and we've been in a pandemic ever since. So this ain't nothing new, and we will get through it. I want to talk about the story, the award, mm -hmm. and what I thought was interesting, and I've always often thought about this, you know, when we um, sit in literature courses, and I think we all have done, have sit, sit in literature courses, when um, Black literature comes up, and the literature, the, the piece is not taught as a piece of literature, but it's taught as sociology or whatever, okay? About social, the things that are happening in the world, but the literary aspects of it are not really um, um, appreciated or, or understood. And so I thought about that when you said that you got this award, but you didn't get it for what you thought you, want, you should have gotten it for, which was the art for mm -hmm. what you're doing at you know, the, the uh, Whittier Writers Workshop. And you are recognized for helping to build and develop the community, you know, yeah. the community. And you thought, well, why would I, why can't people recognize? And then you talked about, you know, that, that, that tired and true sort of um, situation that artists, you know, get into, Black artists get into. And so, uh, but then I thought, but I've, I thought a lot about, about you, um, Carolyn, as being, an activist educator mm -hmm. and, and, and what you do to build community. Mm -hmm. So I thought that this award, even though I, I can see your point and I think it's a valid point and I agree totally, but I think there's two aspects, you know, to that, to, to this award, whether they, mm -hmm. they didn't recognize it, they couldn't recognize it then, mm -hmm. you know, but we can recognize it now. Yep. And so, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I I, I, I just want to congratulate you for that award and the K-Section Award and all, all the awards you have yet to get and, and shall get, you know, um, because of who you are in, in building community and bringing people together. And oh, so um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to say that, but I, I really thought this piece about the award and how um, at the end you say that...
the response told me that once again, I created something of value, and this is you know everybody's um, response to 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 your um, to your work. And the next year, while I was talking with Sherry Fernandez Williams about Nigerian novelist um, Adishi's powerful TED Talk, the D danger of a single story in which mm -hmm. she was fostering stereotypes by treating one story of the people as their own as the only story. Sherry suggested that I name my series more than a single story. Uh -huh. And so I think that that's really powerful because it gets back from, it, it leads, of course, from the point of, you know, your, your beginning, from the, the writing, the interest, the interest in writing and, 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 and being a writer and then becoming a teacher that you didn't think you were, but then uh -huh. you <laughs> yeah. discovered what you are. Uh, and then the awards along the way. And uh -huh. so, um, so anyway, I just want I just I just wanted to point out that particular aspect of your career of your life, um, and you open up this 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 big this this piece this story, um, the award with this this um, quote, the nothing is more difficult than competing with a myth. Mm -hmm. So what what does that mean? And you know I've been trying to figure that out as it relates to the the story itself. For me, it means that. Um, you know, there is a myth out there that um, black people don't just do, well, some, you know, some people are known as artists, but for many of us, there has to be some sort of social service aspect that we're not, I mean, I felt like what I was doing was creating an arts organization mm -hmm. that, that served, you know, I thought it was going to serve a few people in my community and it ended up serving people from all over the Twin Cities who came to learn creative writing, to write, to hone their skills, but it was in a neighborhood setting. And so the mm -hmm. myth was that because it's in a neighborhood setting, it's, mm -hmm. it's not art. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're always, you know, having, I, I feel, we are always, always, always having to compete with some kind of story about who we are rather than who we really are, you know, as we were talking about the other day, and as I mentioned early on, the part about having to compartmentalize ourselves um, because somebody who we're going to meet with has some idea of who we are. They don't see us. Mm -hmm. They do not see me. They see whatever they decide that, whatever they decide uh, black folks are in any moment that they're talking about. And it, I, you know, I, I think it, it, it sort of goes along with W.E.B. Du Bois's, um, you know, discussion about double vision. Yeah. That we have to, you know, always. Oh Lord, we only have a couple minutes left. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> these discussions are so huge because there's so much. But um, I hope that gives you a little bit, anyway, of of, of a response to to what you're talking about. Yes. <sighs> Yes, very much so. Thank you. Yeah, I think Heather said we sort of have to wind it down, right? Yeah, she just put a message up. So is there one final question or, oh, okay. Is there one final question or should we just open it up for anyone who has a question? From Can the I just build upon this final piece, Ms. Carolyn? Because I, I think it's important. As I, as I read the essay, uh, Finally Independent, it spoke to my heart and soul because I was just reading the reports that said things like, for instance, for the American Bar Association, 70% of female uh, attorneys of color are thinking about or have already quit their law firms. I was reading reports from Corn Ferry that there are only three African-American leaders after Ursula Burns retired in key roles in Fortune 500 companies. And when you talked about it in Finally Independent, it's on pages 64 and 65, you okay. gave us a sense of some of the challenges in the workplace. Yeah. And the one piece that really stood out to me as well was when you were even questioned on page 65 of that sense of, was your job making you sick? So mm -hmm. what advice do you give us to be able to not only survive, but also thrive professionally and personally? Because your book does something wonderful. Most books only focus on one dimension of either mm -hmm. my personal life or my professional life. Mm -hmm. Really in this essay, you bridge both. What yeah. should professional colors of color be thinking about? And I think oftentimes you throw this word out there of allyship, but how do we transcend from allyship to being abolitionists to change some of these systems 
What would be your advice based upon that essay for the workplace? Yeah, quite frankly, I'm not sure if we can change systems. We can certainly keep trying, and I do think we should. You know, but for ourselves, we need to take care of ourselves. Um, one of my, I, I belong to two writing groups, and one of them is, um, you know, focused on Black women only. And, you know, our meetings are always at least three hours. And that's because we need to, there's always, you know, some stuff that we have to heal ourselves from that happened that week before we can even think about talking about our writing. And so, I mean, building coalitions, working with each other, recognizing that we are not one dimensional, that we're a whole dad blame person. You know, you have a life as a mother, as a wife, as a, a daughter, as a, a partner, as, um, as a lawyer, as a teacher, as, you know, someone who, who cooks meals and goes to the bathroom and, you know, it's all part of who you are. Do not allow, just because, you know, they say in the workplace, don't bring your personal life to work. I think that's, don't, don't even get me started. I'll start using four letter words and then Heather will have to cut us off. But, <laughs> you know, just recognizing the full dimension of who you are always and mm -hmm. having a network of people that you can call. You know, I tell my daughters, um, I have my phone, thanks to my son, Julian, he taught me how to have my phone on do not disturb. And, Cause I, you know, I'm really technologically challenged and it's really the simplest thing in the world. But I have my phone on do not disturb from 11 to seven at night. And I tell my daughters and my close friends, if you feel like screaming in the middle of the night, you can call my phone and scream all you want. It won't wake me up, but allow yourself to do that. <laughs> allow yourself to scream and then get your butt back out there and mm -hmm. say, no, you are not gonna knock me down. You know, my grandmother, my great grandmother, you know, put me here for a reason and you don't get to knock me down. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Hi, Eric. I love it. Hi. <laughs> yes, we're this getting is... some special requests. Exactly. Yeah, we're getting some questions in and, um, you know, I know we, we have a little bit of time and we'd love to, to kind of pass some of those along and um, I could listen to this conversation for a long time. So I, I hate to jump in here, but I did want to just pass along, you know, um, Carolyn, it's, uh, this is a, a, it's kind of a perfect first question for you as a teacher. Uh, it speaks exactly to the work you've always done. And I think the, the listening that you do is it's a question directly, is there is there some place a person can contact you for writing assistance? It's someone here, I think, you know, who's, who's wondering as a writer or maybe as someone on behalf of someone who's looking to tell their story. Um, you know, what are your suggestions about, about you know, whether it's, it's, it's with you or whether it's with, um, you know, the incredible community, um, you know, here? Um, do you have any, any suggestions for, for this person? Well, the, 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 thing, the things that pop into my mind, if you're not involved with um, a, a degree program at Hamlin or the U or somewhere else, um, and if you can't, you know, you don't really want to go to a, an organization like the Loft, there are several that are black owned and black operated. The um, St. Paul Almanac, Pamela, are you gonna be offering classes in the fall as far as you know? Working on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Working and then there's you know, True Roots. Is, I, I think True Roots has a big community aspect mm -hmm. and black table arts and you can just look up all of these just you know mm -hmm. um they're all online don't ask me how to find them do you work they're online you can find them yourself dot net dot edu dot something or other black table arts dot com mm -hmm. true arts true art true roots um st paul almanac right you in know black, in black ink in black ink in black ink i knew they were Riquette, I'm sorry if you're online. I knew I kept thinking there's another, you know, and then there also, I mean, the loft does have these classes that are focused on people of color um, from, from all the communities of color and indigenous communities. Um, I teach there, I teach at Hamlin. I haven't been doing private classes, but I don't know. We'll see, maybe more than a single story. What, maybe one of our next, I don't know, let me, I'm gonna start dreaming now, so I better shut up and wait for the next question. 
Um, that's great and incredible um, resources and, and you know just a note a good comment from a listener that if you're looking for True Roots that's T-R-U-R-U-T-S um, mm -hmm. for that organization in Minneapolis so um, no that's great you know we do have a, another question here um, from Beverly and, and Carolyn you know I, th I think you know they're they're not gonna let you get away from this the, the, the question is when where and how will you know your name is that something, you know, what, what does that, I, I know that we've touched on that in this conversation already very powerfully. And I think, you know, in the same way that, that when you were working on this book, that was a phrase that it just didn't go away, you know, mm -hmm. as you were contemplating this work and your work. Um, you know, what, what is, is there anything more you'd like to say there about, about what that looks like for you going forward or, or, or in relation to your teaching and your students, your family. Um. Oh, Beverly, she was my son Julian's science teacher in high school, and now she's in <laughs> she's in my Black Women's Writing Group. Um, yeah. Beverly, maybe we should just have some conversations, go for a walk, and contemplate that question, which I've been contemplating since it was first brought to me. Um, oh, Lordy, uh, good question. It's one that I do not have the answer to. It, you know, because um, I don't, I, you know, in the essay I write called, I want to know my name, I believe I leave it open ended. Um, but if I hear my name, I will know it. That's all I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is a, a, a great question that, that, you know, in, in a way, this, this makes me think of a piece like coming clean. The question is, um, you know, advice for a young black woman who is drawn to writing memoir, but so far is tentative about the material, afraid of it. Do you have any advice or encouragement or, or strength to this, this person who asked that question? You know, I believe that we're all a little afraid of our own story. Hmm. We question the validity of it. We question whether, our, you know, do I have anything to say that hasn't already been said? Um, mm -hmm. I think everything's already been said but not by you and not in your own way and your own unique way. And your, there are aspects of your story that are uniquely yours and only you can tell them. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, you can contact me over email and I, you know, I can, we can start a running conversation about that or, you know, every now and then I do these small, small classes um, that are just a few weeks long, you know, um, that help people get started. Uh, I think there's some people in the audience who have been to some of those. Um, but yeah, and then there's, it's not just me, there's lots of people who are, you know, doing, I, I feel like I'm fumbling here. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, yeah, and in, in a way, your, your words, in a way lead, I think, right into that, in, into another question here, which, you know, is related to that idea of of, I want to say too that if, if people want to ask questions of any of the speakers as well, the Pamela please. or Artika or my or my granddaughters, please feel free. But I'm sorry, um, Eric. No, no, thank you for that's absolutely we'd um, we'd love to pass on questions to any, um, you know. So so the you know another question here that I think is kind of related to that that you know finding your strength and and and, and finding that space to tell your story. This is a question from. Um, Christopher Sarkey here in Salt Lake City. Hello, Carolyn. I'm I'm glad your writing is getting out more. I wondered Hi, how I wondered how you persevered until your excellent writing was published. Thanks and love. I have learned to just keep walking, mm -hmm. and you know I think about publishing, and you know. Even Christopher, when you and I were in a group together, that was like a million years ago. You know, the thought of, of publishing crossed my mind. Um, the thought, but but it was more important for me to get the story out. You know, because um, you know I am really I, I deeply believe that there is a a power, a healing power in telling your story, whether it's ever published or not. And I forgot the question. Um, what, what was what was his, what was Christopher's question? Yeah, the, the, how, how did you persevere as a writer? You know, it, it, to to you get just to do that. it. You yeah. just do it. You know, 
you just do it. If you have your eye on winning the Pulitzer Prize or, you know, the, the MacArthur that, you know, or something that we all would love to have. But mm -hmm. if, you write, if you're writing toward that, you're not going to tell your story. You're going to be skewing your story toward a specific um, audience or whatever. I, I personally do not believe in writing toward an audience. I believe in telling my story. Mm. Yeah, um, mm. you know, and then, you know, once we start, once you and I, Eric and Heather and, and Emily started talking about marketing, then that's when I started getting serious about thinking about an audience. But until then, I just decided I'm just going to tell my story, you know, mm -hmm. and I had, I did have my daughters and my granddaughters constantly in mind um, because it, it's just important for them, I think, to hear what I'm saying. So I guess in some ways I would consider them my ideal audience but mm. you know but not not some publisher or whatever but thanks to you eric and josie and heather and emily all you guys that uh, wow here we are <laughs> mm. so i mean for me the idea is just keep writing right and what's important to you right right yeah and, and kind of speaking to that in a way um you know so you you, you know the focus on the writing and then there's the 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 work of, of being a writer or, or being, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that, what, in whatever form you're a storyteller. And, and we got, we have a question here um, from Sen Young Shin. And, and her question is, how can the community support you better aside from buying this book? And that's all caps. Um, and, you know, and, I, and, and so that can be a question for you and, and, or just for writers in general. How do you, you know, how can a community support writers better beyond buying their books? Is there, you know, what else, what else can we as readers do um, or as, 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 as supporters, um, you know, is, is there anything else we can do to, to support our, our writers even better? You know, what comes to me is not a direct answer to Sun Young's question. It's, an, it's a direct answer, I think, to what we've been talking about all along, which is believe us when we tell you something. When mm -hmm. I, you know, when, you know, it, it took something like George Floyd for that, see that man, have his knee on his neck for eight minutes for people to believe something that's that we've been telling you for 400 years. So when someone tells you I'm hurting or the sun is shining or my flowers won't grow, listen, believe them. But how to support mm -hmm. writers? I think Sun Young, you have a better response to that than I could give you because you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Doing, she's um, yeah, she's the editor of A Good Time for the Truth, mm -hmm. which she, you know, I'm grateful to be a part of. Um, but uh, yeah, to just really, um, we need to create spaces for ourselves, which I think Sun Young and I have both done. She has the Poetry Asylum and many other things that she's doing. I have, you know, my groups, but yeah. Right. That's not a, that's not a good answer. <laughs> no, that's, it's a great answer. And, and it, what it's, I'm nodding my head because in a way it's leading to, we've gotten a couple questions and um one from uh jordan holbrook one from t michael rambo and they're and they're both about children mm -hmm. they're both um you know and i'll just go ahead and read them both so, so mm -hmm. you hear their words not mine but then i think you know they, they both are asking kind of um very much in the same direction jordan says what advice would you give to parents of young children in 2020 about how to teach our children to be inquisitive and culturally aware citizens of the world Mm -hmm. And then T. Michael Rambo asks, what can we do as community members um, to aid in our children being okay. able to tell their stories? And I think, yeah. you know, particularly mm -hmm. this year, um, um, you know, what are some of the things that we can do as community members mm -hmm. to give our children strength to this work? Okay, first of all, Jordan is my, my third granddaughter. She lives in Santiago, Chile, and she and Felipe have a one and a half year old beautiful little girl. And uh, she's just, they're just terrific little parents. Excuse me, I don't mean to negate you by saying little parents, but, um, and you know, she's teaching the, her daughter all the time. You know, she's reading to her. She's contacting me and her aunts and, you know, grandparents about with the same questions. And I'm so glad Jordan that you are inquisitive enough to be wanting to know these answers. You've even, you've even given me some book suggestions to read. Um, mm. But, you know, I think you're doing it already. And just keep your mind open and, you know, just maintain that wonderful, beautiful curiosity that you have. And that's been growing ever since, um, you know, we started talking deeply and ever since you became a mom yourself. 
um, and you know you you won't go wrong. You will you'll be learning as Penny is learning. You know you you're all learning together. Um, and T. Michael is an amazing. How how do you explain T. Michael? You know T. Michael is a singer, an entertainer. He's a writer. He's been writing children's books that I hope we'll see on the bookshelves one of these days soon. And I forgot the question. Um, well, yeah, T. Michael was asking, um, you know, if, uh, let me just pull it up here so I can, I can read their words. Uh, you know, what can we do as community members to aid in our children being able to tell their stories? I think you're doing it in, in many ways already, Michael, by the stories that you tell through your songs, you know, um, you can give Michael two words and he'll create a beautiful story from it. Mm. And, you know, and he's writing children's literature. He's using everyday children to tell their stories, not necessarily the beautiful children that we expect to see, but the children mm. that he encounters every day in his life as a teaching artist and as a, a, a community citizen. And he takes their lives seriously and wants them to be validated. Um, mm. And for me, that's huge. Does anybody else want to weigh in on these questions? I know you guys have something to say. <laughs> well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if if they pop up. We'll we'll of course uh, mm -hmm. make face so they can they can begin. Um, you know, the, Carolyn, I did want to, um, and, and maybe just really quickly. You know, I think in a lot of ways you've you've answered. Um, in a way, some of the heart of this question, but um, you know, it, as this one is relates specifically to arts philanthropists, and given your work um, in the community across these decades on behalf of incredible organizations, um, you know, I'm wondering if if your question would be any different, really, here regarding this. This is a question from um, Neil Cuthbert. Neil asks, "You have educated at least three generations of arts philanthropists. What current advice do you have?" for all the new people entering that field so they can see to support incredible artists like you and all the young new artists. Is there mm -hmm. anything specifically to that field, especially now that, um, that you would add to, you know, some of what you've already said, talked about just listening, wow. just hearing us. Um, is there anything else you would mm -hmm. want to add? I love that question, Neil. Um, thank you. I think it's important for people like Neil and me and some of us, you know, from the old old guard to make ourselves available and for the younger people, uh, for us to have these intergenerational conversations like Tess and I, my oldest granddaughter Tess and I are going to have an intergen a public intergenerational intergen conversation next week. But I think mm -hmm. it's important for the young people to know the history of philanthropy in our community. And it's important for us as the old guard to listen to where they're going now. Um, and, you know, I guess I kind of, I think, oh good, Pamela's gonna speak. Um, were you gonna say something, Pamela? No. I saw starting to come in, oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I am less familiar, Neil, with what's going on in the new world of philanthropy than I am with the older world, but I would love to have some, you know, like I said, some intergenerational conversations with the new philanthropists and, you know, people that I have been involved with and, you know, sort of get my arms around what's going on now. I don't know if that made sense or not. Yeah, and, and I think in a way that leads, you know, to another question here. We do have, I think, a, just a little more time for okay. to get to some of these. Um, remaining quest two, two questions maybe um, you know one is is what well, begins with some some words to you that I want to make sure you hear this is from um, an anonymous questionnaire uh, you are so influential and powerful you build culture and touch the lives of so many with your writing community building and role as an educator can you share wow. some of your influences with us I think of you as as being an influence on so many, and and I think you know even just in the way you've you've set up your book, and you've given the opening spaces to the quotes of other voices mm. uh, that resonate to you. Uh, I, I, it, it's and you've spoken a bit about how much you owe to those who 
who come before, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who are, what are some of your influences specifically um, for your work or just in your, in your life? Yeah, I think I did answer some of that. Um, certainly my parents, my mother and my stepfather were amazing influences just watching them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, has always been an inspiration to me. Um, people like Neil Cuthbert, who, and you know, people who in the in the field of philanthropy who who have supported my work over the last thirty some years, him and um, you know Cindy Garrett from the Jerome Foundation and others, um, and just you know people who make comments like the one that you just read. Who, you know, every now and then I'll get a beautiful letter from a student I had ten years ago, that will say, "Oh, wow," you know. Um, you know, maybe the people that I influenced, who have influenced me, maybe I heard them enough to be able to influence the next generation. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I mean, we could talk about my influences forever because I, I think about them, um, you know, in the middle of the night, they'll pop up and me, oh, yeah, that one. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I'm, oh, yeah, I remember what she said that time. But a lot of times students influence me as well as, as my mentors have influenced me. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And, um, you know, I, I want to share one last question and then um, unfortunately we'll need to wrap up. And, okay. uh, but, you know, that you're, you're, how you were talking about these, these other voices that continue to come back to you and that encourage you those, you know, literally encouraging words, however you take that word encouragement to mean. Um, and there's a question, a, a final question here that I think just gets right to the heart of, of, who I know you to be in this book and your work. Um, it's a comment. Many of us, because of single parent stigma and assistance, have a disbelief in getting ahead or are molded from a poverty mindset from mm-hmm. decades ago. Any encouraging words to, su- to approach a different angle in my writing for such a topic? Thank you. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Many of us, because of single parent stigma and assistance, have a disbelief in getting ahead or are molded from a poverty mindset from decades ago. Any, do you have any encouraging words to perhaps approach from a different angle in my writing or getting at a topic like that? What do you say to someone who's feeling um, like, like they're carrying a disbelief that they can get ahead because of these narratives? It's how you were talking earlier about, about being defined you by know what? Our, yeah by if our. if i had a specific audience for my book it would be that woman mm. that person mm-hmm. you know because i pulled myself from um some i i still struggle with that belief but i was about to say i pulled myself away from but i have not pulled myself away from it it's still always there but you know it's because of, of people like 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 her i'm assuming it's a woman people like that person that um, I want them to see that, you know, if I can do it, it's available. It is available to you, to me, to all of us. Um, You have to, you know, it's a difficult struggle, but it's, you know, but we can do it. Um, And just, you know, just write your story, believe in it, believe that it, that it's valid and important and true. And it's it's hard to do that. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Eric. No, I was just going to say what a perfect, and we're, we're unfortunately out of time, but I couldn't yeah. think of a, a, a better message from you to end on. I, I just want to thank everyone, um, you know, from 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 the press, and of course, I'll let Carolyn, you know, um, speak for herself as well. But thank you for joining us today. I just wanted to remind you that this has been recorded. So if there, if you joined us late and you and you couldn't catch the beginning, you can watch the parts that you missed if you want to watch it again and contemplate, share with others, use um, as a group. Just know that that resource is there for you. Um, thank you for taking your time with us. You know, it, it means a lot that we can join together for Carolyn's book and to have this conversation in whatever space we can and, and online here together as a community. And we appreciate okay. your time here. Um, I certainly, and Carolyn, you may want to thank them directly, but thank you to everyone that joined us today, to your granddaughters, to Artika, um, to Tess, to Pamela. It, it meant so much to have you here alongside Carolyn. 
I'll let Carolyn say any closing um, words that she may like to as well. But thank you all so much. And please remember that you can purchase Carolyn's book from Moon Palace Books. And the link is in the chat. Carolyn, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for being here. My cousin, Stephanie Lee Myers, she just posted something. And so many other people. Um, thank you, Pamela, Artika, and my granddaughters for being here. Thanks, Jordan, for, for weighing in with a question. And everyone that I can't see. Um, thank you so much for being here and to the press for, for you know, supporting me. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. We'll go ahead and, and sign off again. Thank you for joining us and, and, and mm -hmm. have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So, uh, can, can we stick around for a little minute? Um, yeah, we'll let Heather send us there. So if I could see everybody just for about a half a second.